Well, if you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 45 to 52. The title, as you can see, is called Kingdom Minded and uh, excited for the things that the Lord has for us. Before we go any further, though, uh, let's go before the Lord together, ask him to prepare our hearts uh, that we would be attentive to what it is that he wants to say to us this morning. Father, we are grateful for the privilege of gathering together. The fact that we can come into this place is a mark of your grace towards us. Lord, that you not only called us to a restored relationship with you, but you allowed us to be members of your family. And so as we gather, um, we not only gather to be connected with one another, but Lord, because your spirit moves in our midst, um, that's why we're here. And uh, one of the ways you do that, Lord, is through your word. And so I just pray right now as we prepare our hearts to hear what it is that you would say to us that we would deepen in our understanding of who you are. And along with that, Lord, that we would deepen in our understanding of the ways in which you want to use us. And so we just commit the time to we pray that you'd be glorified in it. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, it was about a month ago at 3 a.m., my wife woke me up with the words, the alarm is going off. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, but my immediate thought is when an alarm goes off, it's probably a what? Probably a false alarm. And so I wasn't panicked, but because it was 3 a.m., I was trying to figure out what to do. So I grabbed my phone, and uh, our alarm company, whenever the alarm goes off, they call, and they try to get a hold of you. They want to know what's going on. And if you can remember your password, they will tell the sheriff they don't have to come out. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't remember my password. And that had happened to me a time before, but it was the middle of the day, and they were like, ah, it's fine, we'll just tell them they don't have to come. But apparently at 3 a.m., they don't work that way. So I got done giving her every password I could ever ask or even think of, and she finally just says, well, you'll have to tell the sheriff when he gets there because he's been dispatched. And no sooner did I hang up the phone with her that my wife is in the kitchen yelling to me in the room, uh, the sheriff is here. So I'm like, all right, great, so we'll go figure this out. And so I walk out into the kitchen, 3 a.m., and the sheriff's talking to us, and you know, we're trying to figure out, well, why did the alarm go off? And as we're talking about it, he asks me, he says, well, did you guys go outside since you woke up? And I said, well, no, why? And he goes, well, because when I got here, the front door was open. And I, I said, well, that's weird. And I grabbed my iPad and I started flipping through my Ring app to see the videos that were recorded by my doorbell. And wouldn't you know it, I, I got to a certain time and I see someone walking across my Ring doorbell with a hood on and a buff covering their face right through the front door. And then he says to me, he goes, well, did you see any video of them going out? And I'm like, mm, nope. And he says, I need to clear the house. And can I just tell you that everything changes with those words? I need to clear the house. I mean, we literally went from trying to figure it out to now we know what it is we're supposed to do. And so as a dad, my mindset changed. I made a beeline for my daughter's room. I didn't go past my boy's room because I love them less. I went past my boy's room because I thought to myself, if he's in there, he's going to need me to rescue him and I'm not in a hurry to do that. So I get to my daughter's room and I throw the door open and there's nothing in there. And by the time I come out of that, the sheriff has got his gun drawn. He's got that, that 8,000 lumen light sticking off his gun and he's just going through the house. And so they go through my boy's room and nothing. And he goes into our room. He's looking in our closet and he's goes and he's just, he's all over the place. And we start making our way to the other side of the house. And as we're getting to the other side of the house, I remember that we had out of town guests staying in our, our extra little room in the back. So we get to the other side, and I'm thinking to myself, well, here's what we'll do. If, if we get over there, we'll, you know, we'll go over to the door on the other side, you know. Hey, guys. Morning. We need to look around. There might be someone in the house. And, and apparently they don't train the Martin County Sheriff to function that way when they're clearing a house, which is what I learned when we were doing this. And so as I'm processing how to talk to our out-of-town guests, the sheriff walks over to the door between our family room and their room, which is generally locked, but only from their side. 
And he asks the question, is this door locked? And as I said, yes, he pulled the handle and he opened the door and then he throws the curtain back and I'm like, oh no. And he sticks his gun into that room with that eight million lumen light. And he's like, Martin County Sheriff, there's an intruder in the house, we have to clear the room. (laughs) Could you imagine if you planned a vacation to Florida? And you were like, oh, you know, we'll go stay at this place. I mean, it's such a sweet couple. I mean, they were super nice. They, they were so nice. I literally come walking around the corner, and their eyes are like this big, and they have their sheets pulled up. They're both sitting in the bed like this. And as he's like, I need to clear the room. And they're like, okay. And like, no idea what to do. So we get done and we clear all the rooms and there's nobody in the house and now we're trying to figure it out and my boys at this time had finally gotten up and we started asking some questions and it turns out that my middle son had been given a, a buff with a hoodie and, a, and a, a shirt with a hoodie and a buff for his birthday the day before and he had come home a little bit later that night and he was so excited to have it on that it didn't, you didn't need to have the sun out, apparently. He just was going to wear it in the house, so he did. And that was what we saw go past the ring door. And I guess when he came in and he pulled the door shut, he didn't pull it all the way to latch it. And then he armed the house, and when the air conditioning kicked on, it popped the door open. And yeah, you see, it wasn't very funny when, <laughs> when we were trying to figure it out at all. But it was an interesting thing the way that my mindset changed, right? When the sheriff took us from we're trying to figure it out to we need to clear the house, right? Because now we know what the mission is and we know what the goal is. And the goal is to try to figure this particular situation out. I think Jesus spends most of our life trying to get us from a place where we're trying to figure it out to knowing what we're supposed to do as he's called us to live on mission. And the reason I think that is because that's what he's been doing with the disciples. They have been following him, and early on for them, it was kind of like, well, what is this Jesus, and what is he doing, and we're going to leave everything, but we don't really know what we're supposed to do. But by the time they spent enough time with him, he started to send them out. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, we read that he sent them out to get a taste of the mission, and when he sent them out, this is what he said, He said, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then listen to what they get to do. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And so the disciples, they've gotten a taste of the mission, and so they're out doing the things that Jesus told them to do. And by the time we get to Mark chapter 6, verse 30, we read that the apostles had gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And so that's just a little of the background that's led up to the passage that we're reading today. The disciples are out on mission, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. They come back, they're celebrating. And then as they start to feel like maybe they need a little bit of rest, Jesus says, let's go away to a desolate place and you guys can get some rest. And as Jesus takes them away to a desolate place, he's starting to get more notoriety and and the people are kind of following them around. And the, the word of God tells us that When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And so instead of resting, he continues to model what it means to be on mission, and he he starts to teach them about the kingdom of God, and the disciples are watching this, and the disciples in classic fashion, they get to a place where they're like, all right, we're getting hungry, and Jesus has been amazing, but let's send them away. And then Jesus says, why don't you feed them? And then Jesus does something even more amazing. He feeds the 5,000 with just a few loaves and fishes. But by the time we get to Mark chapter 6, verse 45, something turns. And the reason it turns is because Jesus is modeling for the disciples what it means to truly live 
kingdom-minded, what it means to not exist in a place of figuring it out, to being intentional on mission. Listen to what happens. He's fed the 5,000, and then in verse 45, Mark records this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. If you're taking notes, write this down, this lesson from Jesus. Kingdom-minded people live with missional clarity. It may not make sense as you read the text here, but, but the tone of Jesus changes radically. This phrase, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Listen, it's not like, um, it's not like a fun suggestion to go on a little lake excursion. He's not saying that. He's not like, hey guys, that was fun. We fed 5,000. Why don't we go find something else to do? It was like, guys, get in the boat and go now. In fact, the implication in the original language is that it was a forcible decision. He was like, you're going to go and you're going to get on it. Well, why is it that Jesus would do that after feeding 5,000? Well, if you know Jesus' story, before Jesus ever started his public ministry, he spent a little time in the wilderness. And you know, in the wilderness, well, that's where the enemy spent time trying to tempt him. And among the temptations that the enemy wanted to use to get Jesus off mission was the temptation to fulfill the mission God had called him to in a different way than God intended. In fact, we read the story as the enemy is tempting Jesus in Luke chapter five or chapter four, verses five through seven. It says that he led him up and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Question for you, what was the mission of Jesus? He came to save what? He came to save the lost. God so loved the what? The world. He wanted to rescue the world. And so the enemy leads him up and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and the devil says to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. See, the enemy knew that Jesus wanted the kingdoms of the world. But he also knew in order for Jesus to get it, he had to do it God's way. And so part of what the enemy was constantly doing with Jesus was, was trying to get him to do things different than the way that God wanted to. And so Jesus understood that he needed to protect and prioritize the mission. And after he feeds the 5,000, we don't see it in Mark, but we do see it in John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. It says this, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed... They said, truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Jesus makes the turn because he is living his life with missional clarity. He has fed the 5,000, but he recognizes in the masses wanting to forcibly make him king is also the temptation to attempt to do the mission of God in a different way than God had intended. How is Jesus going to win the world? What does he have to go through? He's got to go through the what? He's got to go through the cross. And as these people are seeing him do amazing things, he recognizes that if they forcibly make him king, he is going to get off mission. That's why he just sends the disciples away. Listen, as a follower of Jesus Christ, make a note of this. We have to learn from Jesus the importance of pri prioritizing and protecting the mission that God has called us to. A question for you, what is the mission God has called you to? What are the things that he has asked you to do? How are the ways that God uses you? If, if you don't have a clear sense of that, most of your Christian walk is going to be trying to figure it out instead of living your life on mission. But when you begin to understand the ways that God has called you to be used for his kingdom, when you begin to see the places that God has put you, that need the expressions and the proclamation of the kingdom of God in the midst of all of the brokenness and all of the sickness and all of the despair, that's when you really begin to live the life that God has called you to live. Because you start asking 
God, in the midst of the things that you go through, how am I to respond in this situation knowing what I know about what you've called me to do and who you've called me to be? And then it begins to inform your prayer life and it begins to affect everything. And I'm just telling you, missional clarity, make sure that you get this. Missional clarity is one of the keys to living a life of purpose. If you guys don't have missional clarity, it's going to feel a lot more like wandering. It's going to feel a lot more like wondering. It's going to feel a lot more like trying to figure it out. But can I just tell you, once you get missional clarity, things get really exciting. Have you ever been there? The disciples are getting a taste of it. Look at what it says in verse 46. So they have now sent Jesus out. So we're getting the picture. He feeds 5,000. The people want to forcibly make him the king. He immediately sees the problem with that, not only for himself, but for the disciples. So he tells them, you guys get in the boat and you go to Bethesda. In verse 46, it says this. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. If you're taking notes, write this down. The second thing kingdom-minded people understand is that they have to learn to respond to crisis with courage. This is the good news, bad news about following Jesus. Ready? Here's the good news. He wants you to be a person who is full of courage, right? I mean, is that not exciting to you? I mean, are, there, are, are a bunch of you sitting here going, I, I don't want to have a life filled with courage. I would like to be cowardly and afraid my whole life. I mean, that seems to, be, to me to be some of the best news ever, right? Like my God who I serve is in the business and has a goal for me to be a person of courage. That's awesome. How do you get courage, though? See, because that's the problem, right? You don't just just get courage by doing nothing. You get courage by going from crisis to crisis, right? And and as you go through those crises in life, God, well, he shows up. He shows up in ways that we didn't expect. But, I mean, mean, is is life one of the best curveball throwers you've ever been around? I mean, I mean, can I get a witness? I mean, some of you, like, I, like if, if you look at your life, if you look back, and maybe it's just me, and that's okay, like, if you look back at your life and you hold up the plan you thought you had, right, you're like, this looks nothing like what I thought it was going to look like. Like, there was no way. In fact, I was, I was kind of laughing because I thought, man, if my life could ever make the back of the Bible, you know, the map section, you know, it's like in the, if you, if you go to the, every, you, should, you go to the back, well, listen, mine would look like this. And I mean, I mean, this is a, a true to life, like this is the journey of the children of Jeremy. Like this would be in there from 1997 to 2021, right? It's like from Chicago to San Diego, back to Chicago, from Chicago down to Florida, back up to Chicago, and then back down again to Florida. And that doesn't even include all the cities that we've lived in, which are probably more than the years that we've been married. And my poor wife, pray for her. Because if my wife could have drawn the map, it would have just been a little dot like this. It might have been a big dot because she probably would have taken her hand and clenched her fist and gone like this. Instead, she wants to do this to me. But it's curveballs, right? Like life doesn't work out how we think it should work out. And I would imagine that the disciples were learning that as they were obediently in the boat doing what it is Jesus had asked them to do. And we read that because of their obedience, they're, what are they doing? They're straining against the waves, right? Straining against the waves, and they're going into the wind, and it is the fourth watch of the night. And I would imagine the conversations that they're having did not reflect the amazing things that they had seen in Jesus up until that point, right? Because we've all been there. I would imagine their conversations would be more along the lines of like, he knew this was going to happen. He never should have sent us here. If I had known, 
is God really good? Right? Because those are the questions that we have to wrestle with before we get to a place of having courage. Because what the crisis teach us is that we don't know as much as we think we know about God. And God allows us to go from one crisis to the next because it's one of the ways that he unpacks the things that we believe that are wrong and we give those things over to the Lord and then he builds into us a deeper understanding of who he is. Can I just give you three things that people do in crisis that have courage? We see them in the text here. I think it would be good for you to write them down. I know that I have to remind myself of these things. Uh, First and foremost, people that are courageously responding to crisis know how to abide in prayer. I love that picture of Jesus, right? So, so he, he feeds 5,000, but the crisis for him is this temptation for ministry to be done the way that he maybe thinks it should be done or, or the way the enemy wants it to be done. And so he fights against that. He sends the crowds away. He gets the disciples out of the way. And then we read as he's responding to this crisis of temptation that he leaves and he goes and he prays. And not only did Jesus model that, but he taught us that if we're going to be followers of him, if we want to do anything for the sake of the kingdom, we have to know how to abide in him. In fact, he said, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. He goes, look, if you really want to understand what it means to live on mission, here's one of the important things. If you're going to do anything, you better abide in me. And if you don't know how to abide in prayer both before in the midst of and after a crisis, it's going to be very difficult for you to live with courage. And so people of courage, they abide in prayer. Number two, I love this idea, although I don't enjoy it when I'm in it, but people of courage understand that you have to endure in obedience. How many of you have ever made a decision to obey God thinking that it was going to be awesome if you did it? And then you found out it didn't feel so awesome. Can I get a witness? Right? Like that's what happens to us is we assume outcome of obedience. So we imagine in our minds like, oh, God's calling me to do something or I'm supposed to do this. Like his, his word tells me to do it this way and this is how I should do it. And we think, man, when I, when I do this, it's going to be, it's going to be like a movie. I mean, I'm going to see God do awesome things. People are going to be super impressed with me and they're gonna love it, and then more people are gonna do great things for God. And then we get out into the lake of obedience and we discover that people, well, they're sinful. And even, even, even the Christian ones sometimes don't like people that do the things God wants them to do. And, and sometimes because we live in a broken word, world, circumstances, they don't fall together like we thought they would, right? And like the disciples, we spend our time being obedient. We assumed it would be like putting a big old engine on the back of the boat and going out like a trip to the Bahamas, and instead we're just paddling, right? And we're working, and we're wondering if God is ever going to show up. Well, part of courage is learning to endure in obedience because it is hard to be obedient to the Lord, and there is blessing. But that blessing doesn't come always right away. And you can be sure that there's going to be obstacles to anything that we do that reflects obedience to the mission that God has called us to. But then there's a third thing. While we're enduring in obedience, people who live with courage, they know how to live with hope. Because they expect God to show up. I love this. Don't miss this picture of Jesus. As the disciples are out there, we read that Jesus goes away. He's on the mountain praying. And then when it was evening and the boat was in the middle of the sea... And he was alone on the land. Verse 48 says that he saw them straining. And as he saw them straining, it says that he wanted to or he intended to go and walk by them in the midst of the sea. Now, it's important to understand what's going on here. It isn't saying that Jesus saw them straining and for good times thought, I might just walk right by them and get to the other side and go, hey, we'll see you guys on the other side. Have fun. That's not what he's saying. It actually means that he intended to walk by them in such a way that he revealed himself to them. In other words, he wanted to walk by them so that they could see him. 
because he knew that they were dealing with a major struggle. He knew that they were going to be exhausted, and he knew that things were much harder than they thought they would be. And so do you see the contrast of this, that, that Jesus is looking at his disciples in the midst of this crisis, and in his mind, here's what he says, this is awesome because this is an opportunity for me to reveal myself to you in a way that you don't understand. And how often, how often do we miss it, right? Because, because we don't live with a sense of hope, we don't expect God to do that, and, and yet here they are, and they're in the midst of this opportunity, and they missed it. Look at how they responded to Jesus showing up and revealing himself, verse 49. It says, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and they cried out. For they all saw him and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and he said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished. If you're taking notes, write this down. Kingdom-minded people deepen their understanding of God. I mean, could you imagine me? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God is so much more gracious than I am. Like if I was in Jesus' shoes and I had followers and I took the time to walk on water in the midst of a storm to reveal myself to them and they looked at me and they were like, it's a ghost, I'd be like, I'm out. I'd be like, listen, you guys, I'm gonna walk back on the water and I want you to think about how you responded to me. And you know what? When you're good and tired, I hope you don't end up back where you started. I hope you make it across. Man, I'm so glad God isn't like that with us. I mean, even though they weren't looking for it, even though they misread what he was doing, even though they thought it was worse than it was and they couldn't even recognize him when he showed up, he still speaks these words to him. Take heart. Be of good courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. And then on top of that, he gets in the boat and it says that the winds stopped and they were utterly astonished. Here's what that word utterly astonished means. It means that they went from one state of mind to a completely different state of mind. And I love that Mark adds in utterly, as if that's not enough, right? Like they went from believing this is the worst possible situation, God has abandoned us, we're never gonna get through, and when that thing shows up, whatever it is, it's a ghost. So they went to it's all bad, to Jesus getting into the boat and it's stopping and they were like, God is amazing. I can't believe what just happened. I wonder how many of us miss the purpose that God has for us in the crisis that we go through. It's not that he sends us into crisis or wants us to experience him because he gets some pleasure out of it, but he knows that we live in a broken world and a big part of living in this world is moving from one crisis to the next. But one of the most exciting things about following God is that in those crises, we get a deeper understanding of who he is. And too many of us go through crisis and all we think about is, God, when will this be over? And God says, there's things that you don't understand about me. There's things about me that I want to show you. I want to utterly astound you. But I need you to bear with me. I need you to not be so eager to get through it and take the time to begin looking for me and understanding that maybe part of why you're in this crisis is because there were some things you believed about me that weren't right. Maybe you had a few assumptions about me that need to be shifted, and, and this crisis is going to give you a more clear picture of who I am. And if you'll just bear with me for a little bit, and you'll spend time focusing on me, maybe just maybe you'll understand a little bit more about who I am and what I've called you to. Just write this down so that you understand it. As our understanding of God grows, so does our stability. Listen, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are going to be as stable as your understanding of God. And so the more that you understand him, the more you allow him to reveal himself to you, the more that you 
allow him to give you a bigger picture of who he is? Well, I just, I just think God doesn't want us always to be utterly astounded, right? See, because you get utterly astounded because you didn't believe God was going to do certain things and then he did them, right? Which is awesome. Like, you've ever been there? Like, that's awesome. But I don't think that's where God wants us to end up. God wants us to get to a place where when we go through this storm, we're a little less astounded and then we get to this storm and, and we finally get to a place where now we're expectant of God showing up, right? Because one of the things that we've learned about God is that as we grow in our understanding, we have, we have more stability. It's, it's kind of like being a person in Florida and how you think about hurricanes, right? Like, like have you ever been around a, a northerner who's moved down here for their first hurricane? Now, listen, I'm going to go easy on you because I'm one of them, okay? So all in love. But I remember like the first hurricane season, you come down and if you're not from here, you're like, oh, hurricane season, man, what is this? And you're watching the news and, and, and then they come on and they're like, there's a, there's a disturbance in the tropics. And you're like, I gotta get gas. And I think I'm supposed to go to Home Depot and get boards and stuff. Yeah, we're, and then those are the people that everybody else hates because you're like, mm, calm down, right? And I go, well, but there's a disturbance in the tropics. Yeah. Well, that's disturbing to me. And why aren't you disturbed, right? And we go through this whole thing. And then when you've been here for a little while, like some of you have been, it's like, oh, yeah, there's a Category 5 hurricane out there. And you just walk outside and you're like, eh, it's all right. <laughs> go back inside. Well, we'll check it in a little bit. And maybe we'll put the shutters on half the house if we need to, right? I, w I would suggest to you that if we're growing in our understanding of the Lord, it changes the way that we deal with crisis. And we move from a place of being panicked and freaked out, and God is still faithful, right? To a place where we expect him to show up. And that's what maturity is. Maturity has gone from a place of not knowing how to handle a crisis and questioning everything that you believed about God to a place that you say, I don't know what God has planned, but I know that he's going to show up. And so instead of living with this crisis, hoping that it's going to be over, we live in the midst of those situations going, what is God going to teach me about himself in this? I'm just telling you, that's a way better way to live. And if we're going to be kingdom-minded, we have to be committed to deepening our understanding of who God is. Because you're going to hit the storms. You're not going to avoid them. We live in a fallen world. But God wants us to display his goodness and his character and his courage in the midst of those things. Last thing, you have time for one more? Look at verse 52, I love this. So he shows up, he reveals himself, he calms the waters. They're utterly astonished. They can't believe that God has done this. And then in verse 52, we get this really awesome kind of loving, dry rebuke. It says, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their hearts, their heart was hardened. I mean, what a way to put it, right? Like Mark, that's awesome. Yeah, that, that miracle where God fed 5,000 people, they didn't get any insight from that incident. No, nothing. Their hearts were just hardened. If you're taking notes, write this down. Kingdom-minded people memorialize God's faithfulness. They memorialize God's faithfulness. What I mean by that is, is that when God does something amazing, they don't move on from it and forget it as if it never happened. They actually get to a place where they go, I can never, ever forget what God did here. Why do they need to do that? Well, because the things that God did in that moment are designed not only to reveal to us a bigger picture of who God is, but inform how we deal with what we're going through right now. And so we remember it. In fact, the language that, that uh, Mark uses is, is is, is language that, that alludes to a piece of the puzzle. In other words, as they were, as they were 
in the midst of this situation, and as God had gotten them through this crisis, they were not putting the pieces of the puzzle together. I mean, I hate puzzles. So any, do, can, where are my puzzle haters? Puzzles are the worst. I mean, I don't know who decided to cut up a picture into a bunch of little shapes and put them back together, but that is such an inefficient use of energy. My wife, though, loves puzzles. We have puzzle lovers here. Okay, we'll, we'll take a moment and pray for everybody in this room that is a puzzle lover. I mean, when we get to the holidays, like our house has got puzzles all over the place. Like we have to buy card tables just for puzzles. And then they sit in the house from like Thanksgiving until New Year's and you can't touch them. They, they stay out for months. And I'll come home and so much wasted time, I'll come home and my wife will be just putting puzzle pieces together. I don't, I don't get it. But... But it is a good illustration for how it is for us, how we're supposed to live, right? Because what happens when you do a puzzle? Well, you get a little piece of the bigger picture, and the more pieces you get, the more clearly the picture makes sense to you, right? And the problem with the disciples is God was giving them pieces of the puzzle. And when they fed the five, when Jesus fed the 5,000, that was a big piece to the puzzle that they were supposed to use while they navigated the storm on the lake. And so what it should have been is something to this effect. Guys, this is a bad situation right now. But do you remember when Jesus, do you remember when he fed the 5,000? Look, I don't know how that happened, but all I remember is he kept grabbing bread and handing it out and grabbing bread and handing it out. And I kept looking going, that bread is going to run out. And it didn't. And then he took those fish and he kept giving out fish and he fed 5,000 people. And we had a whole pile of food left. Now, I don't know for sure if feeding 5,000 people is harder than getting us across a lake in a boat, but I'm guessing it probably is. So I have to assume that if God can do that, this thing with the boat and the lake on the other side, it's probably not a big deal. Let's just keep seeing what it is that he's gonna do. Let's keep being faithful and let's, let's keep moving forward. How are you doing with memorializing God's faithfulness? Because the alternative is that your heart gets hard. If, if you don't take the things that God has done and, and remember them, and gain insight from them, and apply them to the things that you deal with moving forward, then your heart will just get hard. And then when you get into a crisis, instead of being strong, because God has strengthened you by his spirit, you will look no different than the rest of the world that doesn't know this amazing and awesome God that we serve, right? And this is God's desire from the beginning. We see it in Joshua. Joshua chapter 4, just, just by way of reminder that God has always asked his people to memorialize his faithfulness. When Joshua leads the children of Israel across the Jordan River, we read in chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, so Joshua called the 12 men that he appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel for how long? Forever. That's what it means to memorialize the work that God has done. You do it so that you get strength, and you do it so that your children get strength. Because the opposite of that is what Pastor Dan always teaches us. We start to speak our circumstances, right? When we start to talk more about the problem than the solution, we start to talk about the crisis rather than the God who can show up and make it stop like that. And Jesus wants us to be kingdom-minded. Can I give you homework? I'm going to anyway. So, thanks for obliging. One question for you as you leave. If you can answer this question, then you will begin to move 
from trying to figure things out to living life as a person who is kingdom-minded. And the question is this. What is my purpose in the mission of the kingdom of God? That's it. Because God wants you to move from trying to figure it out to living the life he's called you to live with great intentionality. He wants you to live with missional clarity, meaning I know, I know what he's called me to do. I know the gifts that he's given to me. And so as I move forward in my life, my priority is to fulfill these things. And I know that as I do that, I'm going to hit some crises, and that's okay, because I'm going to respond to those crises with great courage, because I know that my God is faithful. And while I'm going through those crises, I am going to constantly seek to deepen my understanding of who God is, because I know that as I do that, he will bring stability to my life. And as God does move, I'm going to memorialize the things that he does, not only for my sake, in the next crisis, but for the sake of my children and my children's children and all those that God would give me the privilege of interacting with, that they would know him too. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, we are grateful for your word, and I am always amazed, much like the disciples, because I forget that you are so faithful to reveal yourself to us. That, Lord, when we open your word, you truly do discern the thoughts and intents of our heart, and along with that, you conform us to your image. And Jesus, you modeled better than anybody else what it means to be kingdom-minded. And so we ask that you would help us to do the same. Father, we ask that you would help us to live lives with missional clarity, that we would understand what it means to fulfill our role in your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would help us to respond to the crises that we experience in life with great courage, knowing that you are going to show up, knowing that your desire is to meet us where we're at. Lord, we pray that we would deepen our understanding of you, recognizing that a big part of our insecurities and our doubts and our questions are because we misunderstand things about you. And and you are a God who wants to reveal yourself to us. And ultimately, Lord, help us to never forget the things that you do. Let them be fuel for us as we continue to live on mission. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the work you're doing in this church. We love you. We pray that you would fill us fresh with your spirit and go with us from here. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You guys have a great week in Christ. We'll see you next week.